everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is employment attorney Peter Raybar. Peter, thanks for coming on in. Great to be here again, Brittany. Thanks for having me. We have a big conversation. As we know, last month, the Supreme Court overturned years of precedent when they officially ruled colleges cannot use race as a factor when it comes to admissions. I want to talk about the impacts that this has on the workplace as a whole. What's your assessment? Well, a lot of people want to connect the decisions to the workplace and, you know, sadly for them, there's not a direct connection. Uh, the cases are very specifically about college admissions and the processes used for, you know, admitting students to, to colleges. Uh, but how decisions are made in the workplace are very different and the rules and laws that apply to those decisions are very different. So there's not a direct connection that a lot of groups are trying to make. but Employers should certainly take heed to what was stated by the court, what was in the decisions, and, and how they shape the diversity programs and recruitment processes going forward. Let's dive a little deeper here. Let's take a step back. What are those differences in affirmative action when it comes to college admissions versus the corporate world? Sure. I mean, in the college decision-making process, as, as we saw in the opinions, as we read in the opinions, race was used as a factor in the decision making it was one of the factors that admissions officers considered that's not how hiring works in fact it's the total opposite companies are not allowed to use race or other protected factors under the laws as as criteria for hiring now they can have diversity programs and initiatives and goals and ambitions but when it comes to the actual decision of who to hire or not hire race or gender or age or disability or any other protected cat category shouldn't be a factor in that decision. So will the Supreme Court ruling change or impact that pipeline of talent at all then? It might. I mean, one of the one of the underreported elements of, of this story, which has been thoroughly reported, mm -hmm is that the court actually left a lot of room for colleges to consider race and other uh, factors. They just have to find a different way to do it. And the court provided a roadmap to do that. Now, what impact is it going to have on the pipeline of candidates for the universities, for, for employers? We don't know yet. It's, it's simply too early. We haven't even heard from colleges about how they're changing their decision-making process for admissions. Um, so. We, we have a ways to go uh, on that, frankly, and it's a legitimate fear, but it's not one that um, has come to fruition in any way just yet. And in the same vein, I guess my next question would be is, how is this going to impact corporate DEI initiatives then? Well, we're already seeing attacks on these programs. Um, there are advocacy groups across the country who are frankly misusing the court decision to go after corporations and their diversity uh, and equity programs. We've even seen government officials do it. In fact, uh, this week there was a letter from 13 attorney generals you know, warning the top companies in the country not to use race or gender and, and, and other protected characteristics in their decision making. And the reality is that's already prohibited. Uh, they've also misconstrued what the decision said and what the companies have said. So. You know, it's going to be an active battle. We're already seeing it. I think it's really important for companies to stick to their values and, and be clear about what's important to them. You know, diversity can be important to a company. There's nothing illegal about that. Um, but it's really about how, how that's implemented in the individual decisions. I want to talk about just how important that is for companies and the corporate world. If you go back a few summers, in the summer of 2020, we saw a lot of DEI pledges from corporations after the murder of George Floyd, as well as when social movements started sparking around the country. Three years later, as you and I sit here, are those pledges being held up? What's the status on that? It's a really good question. Um, before the affirmative action decisions, there was a lot of talk about how companies had not been living up to their pledges. And, you know, there's been a very lo robust labor market over the past few years uh, emerging from the pandemic. There's been a lot of employee movement. There's been a rise of, in employee activism. Many companies have been struggling just to hire enough 
uh, employees for their needs. So I, I think if we, you know, really examined uh, whether the companies have met their targets, probably not. Is there anything illegal about having a goal to be more diverse? No. And I think we're now seeing, you know, politicians and others attack statements that were made post George Floyd about wanting to be more diverse and more inclusive and use that as evidence against companies. And, and the reality is just, it's totally fine for a company to have those ambitions. It's a totally different story if they're using race in a particular hiring decision, but that's always been illegal. The, the, the court decision didn't make that happen. A lot of companies in the U.S. have fallen flat or short on their DEI pledges from three years ago. So what's your take as an employment attorney? Can employees do anything to hold their companies accountable? Employees are doing a lot to hold their uh, employers accountable. Uh, and we've seen that in the past couple of years emerging from the pandemic. The number one thing they're doing is if employers aren't meeting their promises to them, they're leaving. They're going to other jobs. And that comes at a tremendous cost for employers. You know, it's a very tight labor market. You know, unemployment's at 3%. It's a, at historic lows. So, you know, for an employer to lose an employee is a very difficult situation. And in certain industries, it's almost an impossible situation. So if you're an employer and you're making a pledge to be more diverse and uh you better deliver on it because employees are watching. And when these pledges aren't met, if it's important to them, they will leave and go somewhere else where they feel it has been met or it is better environment for them. In the wake of the Supreme Court decision just a few weeks ago, my colleague wrote something and I wanna get your take on it. They wrote this, businesses won't be able to rely on top schools for a diverse pool of applicants after the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling. What do you think of that editor's assessment? It's definitely the doomsday scenario, I think, if, if you value a diverse workforce. Uh, but I, I think it's a little premature. I think the, you know, the priority for employers right now should be to really figure out what's the best way to build a diverse workforce, no matter what happens in the colleges. So, Maybe you need to broaden the, the scope of the schools you're looking at. Maybe you need to look at, you know, more regional schools, more community colleges, et cetera, and really work harder in the recruitment process to find the shining stars. And given how competitive admissions is anyway, I think a lot of employers have been doing that regardless. Um, and as a parent of a, a college aged, you know, child, I would say where you go to school is actually less important than it's ever been to employers. They're more interested in what your skill set is and you know what you studied and what you've done and and how that how the story all comes together for a particular candidate rather than did you go to Harvard or not. Well for college age kids listening, I'm sure that's great news. But in the wake of this ruling, what's your advice to employers? What proactive steps, aside from that recruitment advice, should they be taking? Employers should be looking at their policies regarding hiring, recruitment. They should be looking at what training they provide to individuals you know, within their company who participate in these processes. So what kind of questions can you ask a candidate? Can't you ask a candidate? Um, what, what do job descriptions look like? I think all of these things need to be revisited with an eye to potential challenges because we know there are groups out there who are looking to set up employers to come after them and say, oh, you're discriminating against, you know, uh, uh, white applicants or, you know, your your DEI program is is illegal. So I think companies are already working with their attorneys and their consultants to look at their programs, how they're how they're described, what the objectives are. They're doing things like avoiding specific numbers that provide, you know, that could be misinterpreted as as quotas. Um, so there, there are steps that employers should be taking. I'm certainly not advocating for employers to just sit back and ignore these decisions, um, because even though they're not directly applicable, we know that there are groups out there who want to, to bring this fight to the workplace. Something that you just said that startled me is someone coming after a company saying your DEI programs are illegal. Is there any there there, or is that just a scare tactic? Well, I think a lot of these efforts are 
just pure intimidation tactics. I mean, I referenced uh, an attorney general's letter earlier. If you read the letter carefully and you look at the sources they cite to, it doesn't even stand for what they represent in the letter. So someone could receive that letter and be very scared and intimidated by it. It's signed by 13 attorney generals. These people should know what they're talking about. Um, but there are scare tactics, and then there are groups who dig in and send in false candidates to probe and see you know, what companies are asking and what they're looking for. So if you're an employer, you need to make sure that the people on the front lines, the ones who are conducting the interviews, are not saying things that are inappropriate or not saying things that would misrepresent what you're actually trying to do in a hiring process. So this is a time for employers to you know, really sharpen the skills of those, those individuals and, and make sure that they're in compliance all across the board. Peter Raybar, per usual, thanks for coming on and thanks for your insights. Great, great being here, thank you.